for those who don't know, Tim is a professor, um, ecological economist, which I want to dig into what that actually means, um, and a writer. He's written plays, love stories, dramas, and even a radio play that I've downloaded now. Um, which one is it? Uh, the Environmental Thriller. Is oh, what okay. I thought. I thought that's seven and a half hours long, Louise. You know that, don't you? <laughs> Well, that sounds like, you know, I could start my running routine again or something like that. Yeah, yeah, they're 15-minute um, 15, 15 episodes, so little bite-sized chunks. Perfect, so that, that sounds just about right then. Perfect. And you're now um, running the CUSP, so the Centre for Understanding Sustainable Prosperity, um, which I think we should talk a little bit more about. But you've also you've worked for Friends of the Earth quite early on in your career and actually started that economic spent and and you're a father of several grown-up children is that right three yeah yeah three, yeah, yeah I agree they, well. they 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 claim to be grown up yeah <laughs> um and I just I wanted to just say you know I was actually really surprised by the book because um it was much less markets and economics and much more the sort of philosophical question of human happiness and flourishing and as someone who went to I went to university thinking I was going to study economics and become an economist and I very quickly dropped quite a lot of my economics modules in favor of philosophy so I was so this is just my kind of book and and really um, you reminded me of my favorite subject at uni which was um, a sort of Aristotelian ethics so um, you know I loved it I had a brilliant Mm. professor and um, Mm. but but that for me was really the kind of that, that storytelling that when you say you're a playwright. So I want to hear a little bit about your playwriting career and how did you decide to do that? Ooh. When when did you start writing plays as well as writing, you know, economics? and doing- Well, I definitely started writing plays before I started writing economics, interestingly. Uh, I did a little bit of economics at, um, at school. I didn't really get on with it. I found it very dry and it's sort of conceptual forms, very difficult for ordinary people to sort of get, that excited about lots of definitions, a few formulae, which I couldn't entirely, uh, I, I, they just didn't, they didn't seem right to me. And at the time I just thought I was being stupid. So I kind of ran away from economics very fast. And I think, I don't know, but I think I always wanted, uh, I always liked writing and I always wanted to write, I wrote short stories when I was very young. And then when I was at university, I just, um, I be- became involved in the drama stuff that was going on and started writing plays there. And one of those plays was picked up quite early on by the BBC. And suddenly I had this, what I thought would be my career, to be honest. I thought, you know, okay, this science stuff is all very well, but I really like that storytelling thing. It appeals to something very human. And 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 I always think writing in a way is a, is a way of living more than once because you become so much a part of the stories of your characters and and you can be so many different people i mean so you'll you'll hopefully get there in the cry of the bittern which is the environmental thriller that you've got seven and a half hours of to to, to, to get through um the, the one of my favorite characters in there is so opposite to who i am mm. and and was actually the easiest character to write which was really which is really bizarre um and and so you know you can write these villains and really inhabit these different worlds and you can you can also have conversations which you can't have as an environmental professor because you're you're supposed to you know profess and you're Mm. supposed to have a theory and you're supposed to stick to it and you're supposed to provide evidence and and back it all up and then you get people attack you and that means you have to stick even harder to your theory and defend it even more and and in writing, you don't have to do that. You know, in drama, you, you can't do that because drama is about conflict. Conflict is about difference. You have to have these different characters. You have to believe in them all. You can't have a favourite, really. So this sense that the drama, what drama does and opens up for you is it allows you to talk about issues, not different issues necessarily, but you talk about the same issues sometimes in a way that you cannot do as an academic. And 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 that's really lovely. And it, I would say for a, quite a long time, it kept me sane having that as a sideline, um, you know, while I was developing my academic career in particular in the early days. In the late, more lately, I, and I have to, I say this with some sadness, I've not done very much um, writing of that kind, of that dramatic kind. Um, but what I have done, and I think this sort of brings us on in a sense to post-growth, is I've tried to, 
instill my my more academic writing if you like my more intellectual writing with that sense of poetry and with that sense of character oh. and with that sense of story can and actually people are going to think we've planned this and we haven't but i i was wondering if you didn't mind because one of the things i thought was so extraordinary about the book was was the language you use and i wanted to read a passage because whilst the book club members are normally brilliant at reading books in advance some people won't have read it and I if you don't mind I'll just read a little passage of why that I think the style of the book as you know as well as the content will come on to lots of the content was brilliant um if you don't mind um so uh, one moment you're self-evidently heading for disaster and yet the next you are inexplicably slipping unscathed beneath the medieval stones they're cold Historicity grazes your outstretched fingers. Grey-green light shimmers on the moist archway. Its musty scent conjures the grim reality of long-forgotten lives. Liminality is populated with the restless specters from early transitions and uncomfortable glimpses into the immortal abyss. Like, wow, that's not an economics book I was expecting. Um, You know, I'm really, it's quite difficult. I mean, it's quite... Uh, it's I loved the fact that you read that and thank you for reading it um it's quite it's quite eerie sort of hearing it read back but I don't know if you know this story but but, but actually that passage was picked out by a review of the book in the Guardian that was absolutely no. trashing it no <laughs> yeah Are you trashing kidding? it on the basis <laughs> of that hilarious. passage no, like, what, thought... what is this guy on you know where's um carbon taxes and um equilibrium markets you know what's he telling us with this passage so i'm really really pleased <laughs> that he, i will speak to the <laughs> guardian review whoever i'll write that. another review it definitely needs definitely one i was i was i was gutted when i heard that you know i just think well, he's just he's picked up the not the passage but certainly that idea that writing matters and that style matters and that and that there's more to a book than content uh, and substance and and fact and and he's trashed it and I oh. you know I kind of since that was partly it was almost in, not entirely but it was one of the things that I was trying to do in the book it really uh it really hit me hard when when that oh, well, review came out so thank you I'm sorry to hear that and I don't have the reach of the Guardian but I'll, I'll definitely um <laughs> write a letter to them or a comment on the page the yeah. um because I, th- I think that's really important, and I want to, I would love to come back a little bit to, to um, that because the na- the question of narrative and and myth comes through in in, in the book over and over again, and I, I want to come back to it. Um, I have one question, just back to your sort of personal path, which was just around how how did you decide to go into academics of all things you know oh, from yeah. NGO to yeah. all, why is academia the place that you could have most of impact you think no it was total it was accident it was chance really it was um I I, I thought I was going to have a career as a playwright until I got my first check from the BBC and realized I might <laughs> have to wait on tables or do some odd jobs here and there which I did for a couple of years or a year or so and then and then in April um, 1986, Chernobyl men- melted down. And, mm. and it, it was really, it was like a kind of wake up call for me. It was like, uh, you know, do I, 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 to some extent, and this seem, might seem a little bit naive, but I didn't really even know that we got so far with those technologies that they now represented end of life dangers to the rest of humanity. And I kind of, I turned my back on it in a way. And I'd been, early on, I went on marches with CND for my parents and that kind of thing. And during university, I was actually rubbing shoulders with people who were working in the nuclear industry. And many of them went to jobs after after their, their, their degrees and their doctorates and so on. Um, and I, you know, I, I really turned my back on academia partly partly for that reason. I thought they were, you know, barking up the wrong tree in terms of technologies that were dangerous, in terms of things that didn't connect to people's lives. And I want I knew that I wanted to do something different. But then but then when Chernobyl happened, it kind of made me realize that I had a set of skills, that these skills were relevant to the situation, that and that and that I cared about it. You know, I can remember this one day in particular. It was a beautiful day in the spring of of, of 1986. And and um, you know in the in the Suffolk countryside that happened, and and I was listening to the news as the sun was shining and nature was at its April best, and and the news was all about how you know radioactivity was falling on the the sheep farms in Wales and the lamb market was going to be you know completely trashed mm-hmm. because of it. Farmers were losing were in danger of losing their livelihoods, 
And it's sort of, it was, it was like, actually, even without doing anything, we could sit here in the most beautiful day, enjoying the sunshine, not even knowing that we're trashing the things that we love the most. And that scared me. I mean, it kind of, it scared me, but it also woke me up. And pretty much the next day I walked into actually first the offices of Greenpeace in London and said, look, you know, I've got these degrees. I understand physics. Um, I, I don't know much about any of this deep campaigning that you're doing um but is there something that you can you know something i can do and they they set me working on on the economics of renewable energy and i became by token a a sort of accidental economist a couple of years later i got a a research post and and it was almost like that's what i was supposed to be doing because that's what the world wouldn't let me not do it kind of kept drawing me back into it and eventually in academia and the good thing about academia it's not all good but there are good things and one of them is that you can afford to have thoughts which are which lie outside the conventional paradigm you can afford to be challenging you can think differently um as long as you bring the students and the money the grant money in you can kind of (laughs) You can kind of buy yourself a little bit of freedom. And I had the freedom in that situation to, to develop some of this work. That, make, that makes sense. I like the idea of, the, you know, the, the universe was pulling, pulling you into this. And, and I guess that actually leads me to what's normally one of my first questions which was, would you just give us a, a sort of brief, these are the tenets of the book. This is what you wanted to say with it, just for anybody who hasn't... Um, hasn't had the chance to read it because you know I, I picked a paragraph that I thought really reflected the style but not necessarily covered all the content obviously yeah um I mean I think the story of the book to some extent goes back to my work with the sustainable development commission um where I was an economics commissioner from 2004 to 2011 and the and we, and we looked a lot during my time there at what prosperity means and how it you know maybe maybe it needed redefining and we also looked at you know, the, the kind of limits to growth arguments and where we stood in relation to those. And, and at the end of that time, I wrote a report to government called Prosperity Without Growth, which was then picked up as a, as a book and then, you know, translated kind of pretty much worldwide, actually, 17 or 18 different translations out there. And, and I mean, what, what I think, it was, a, it was a very interesting experience. I mean, I thought I was writing a report to the government and the government would listen to it and things would change and that would be great. But, but actually, <laughs> at that point in time, that was the last thing that the government wanted a government advisor to be advising was that we should question the growth-based model of the economy. Mm. And, and, and they pretty much sort of gave it what I you know, politely would call a cold shoulder. There was also some wrath involved from certain places. But, there was, but what happened was a surprising audience that I had never known was there, never expected. And it ranged from, you know, uh, book clubs and, and libraries in community halls to the UN to financial institutions who actually wanted to have this conversation and, and, and in numerous different countries. And, and I kind of felt, you know, and it was brought home to me by a conversation I had with one of the people who read that earlier book who said, look, you know, Tim, this is great, but this is a policy document ultimately um it's got lots of good things in it but couldn't you write something for ordinary people for people who don't like statistics and graphs and 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 aren't particularly economists and don't really get all that stuff and so one of my aims in post growth was to address that issue about the limits to growth on a finite planet and and what prosperity can mean when we take those limits seriously um and and to make that accessible to people to write in a sense not a sequel to prosperity without grace, but in, but almost a little bit of a prequel, and to and to ground it in, also to ground it in in real human story, to ground it in the stories mm. of the people who had inspired my own um, vision of what a post growth society might be and and could be, and and to give that you know to do that with this 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 kind of um, almost poetic vibrancy um, in the hope that. It would, as this person was trying to get me to do, it would, it would actually encourage a wider audience, broaden the conversation, allow us to think, to have a deeper conversation about the kind of society that we want and what progress means there. Mm, no, and and, um, and have you found have you fa- found any sort of surprising um, new members of that wider audience? Has there been anything where you thought, oh, I really didn't think he, she, they were going to read it or there's been a response in a um in a particular way yeah i mean yes i'm continually surprised in a way um 
you know, I did, I've, I've done, I've done a lot of, a lot of kind of interviews and podcasts and things. And one of the most interesting one was a kind of, you know, middle, middle ground, middle states, um, ordinary ex farmer who had his own podcast show in the Midwest in, in America. And, and, and he just, I mean, we just had this conversation that I really loved because it was so kind of real and authentic and unacademic and unpolicy oriented. But but he could drill down into what I was trying to do in the book and relate to it in a very human way. And that's those are the conversations that I really, you know, I really love that. I, I and because I think, you know, one of the lessons from Prosperity Without Growth was that over twelve years of setting out policy prescriptions and what people, what politicians could do on Monday if they really had the political will to do it and talking mm-hmm. about the technology and talking about the changes are needed in economics, talking about the changes in enterprise, talking about changes, shifts towards different kinds of investment and a prescription of policies that people could follow to do it. Realizing that that linear path of having, you know, a logical argument towards uh, a situation where you're giving advice to the government and government makes policy and policy enacts changes just doesn't happen. It just doesn't mm-hmm. happen. And 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 so, you know, then and and for that reason, post growth is is again not a sequel to prosperity without growth. It doesn't have it doesn't make an attempt to lay out more and more policies and to you know underpin them with evidence. What it does instead, and this was I think my learning from that experience, is it goes back to philosophical principles it goes to the underpinnings of our beliefs it questions the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves and and in doing that it it allows more people to come into that conversation and and that process of kind of conversation from conversation change from change to happen in a kind of more organic way um and, and actually a more realistic way than the way that i kind of think that many policy documents imagine change yeah happening which is what we hope because it was going to be one of my questions was are you still optimistic about government (laughs) shifting but you've you've answered that i'm optimistic about the prospects for government um i'm you know that i haven't given up on the idea of government i think it's wrong to give up on the idea of government and and i think you know our many people do give up on the idea of government and i think we're giving up on it at exactly the point that we need it most and so we should be trying to stick with that faith but we shouldn't we shouldn't let government off the hook we should we should you know hold it to account one of the chapters in the book of course is about that that yeah. conundrum um great um and actually that fits in david bent has just popped a question in which is you know what are the strongest sort of good faith arguments against your core propositions and how have you re- or do you respond to them is there any the pushback maybe from government or from from elsewhere I think the strongest good the good faith the strongest good faith argument is that we have developed over uh, seventy or eighty years, probably since Keynes, uh, an economics that is predicated on um, continual growth, exponential growth, and that has created a system in which actually almost everything depends on the progress of that growth. So you know, returns for our pensions, the savings structure, the the investment structure that we use, the way the property market works, the way that government funds its welfare programs. Uh, a lot of that way that companies survive quite often predicated on on continuing growth and and we have not got the post growth economics that we need um it sort of brings me back a little bit to cusp because one that's one of the things that cusp is trying to do is to sort of say actually at this point in time the growth rate in advanced economies has been declining actually for almost half a century and 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 the underlying labor productivity growth rate which gives you economic growth mm-hmm. is virtually zero and that means that we are already living in a post growth world and our assumptions that we can have this continual you know x percent growth rate uh, are no longer valid and yet we don't have the economics to deal with that situation we're still trying to force growth out of a system in which growth is slowing down but i do think that the argument you know those arguments from from jobs from a growth-based imperative for for solving issues around welfare without growth um, and and so on and so forth those are those are legitimate arguments but they're not arguments not to have the conversation. They're arguments to have that deeper conversation and to begin to build the economics for this post-growth world. And can, if I can drill down, <laughs> in a sense, if I, is a very layman's question of and how long is that going to take? When are you going to be there <laughs> to to uh, to build something? I guess a new system that seems 
viable. So we can, so so the risk of of abandoning that growth is there. Do you think that? Yeah, I mean, I that time? yeah. I know the, it's a tough sort of basic question. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we should wait for that. You know, I, we have we have some tentative answers to some of the questions. We know that some of the changes will be disruptive, but we also know we have to make those changes. We know that we need we will need sort of you know mixes of public intervention and whatever's happening in in private investment. We know that we we unless we put structures in place to make that shift, it isn't going to just happen on its own. Um, and we've got, you know, political processes like COP26, at which some of those changes could realistically, actually with sufficient political will, be put in place tomorrow. So, so some of the answers to some of the questions, we do have tentative answers to, and we got a few more of those through the, through the pandemic, and in yeah. particular in terms of the power the government could have when it made that sort of dramatic shift of saying, you know, prosperity is about health. It's not about wealth or not always about wealth. And, and, and when you say prosperity is about health, you protect the health of the population. You, you build hospitals as fast as you can. You shut down parts of the economy. If you need to, you provide livelihoods for people and you use the sovereign power of money that governments who issue their own currency have in order to achieve that. And that was an extraordinarily learning moment. It was a moment that we learned that a lifeboat economics is within our remit and i think it's exactly the kind of you know the kind of way that we have to approach the climate crisis and the and the nature crisis the biodiversity crisis no yeah no um that's the hope right that's that's how um what i feel i think um with with the pandemic uh, and then cop coming hot on the heels is sort of what what happens at at the cop um conference in glasgow soon will be really interesting whether it would actually have shifted the conversations significantly enough um yeah i mean i would also say louise that you know in a way your question you know how long have we got and are we going to get there soon enough i, I always to some extent i try to resist that question okay. um there's a lot of what I sometimes call apocalypsism um, that's rampant um, at the moment, and it, and and the difficulty with it is it tends to it tends to tends to make you feel like a rabbit in the headlights. You know, mm. there's not enough time to do it. There's no point in doing it. So you know, I'm just going to go and enjoy my life or sleep or whatever. Um, and and I think it can be quite damaging, and but also not very exciting. You know, I think there's something exciting about acknowledging that we don't know how long we've got, and we don't know all the answers. And that are the answers that we have had don't work anymore and they don't work for very specific reasons. And we can address those reasons and we can talk about them. And in talking about them, we can learn from each other about possibilities for the future that we never knew existed. And, and in a way, that was another of the things I wanted to do in post growth, which was to sort of suggest that a, a world after capitalism is not a poorer, more Spartan, or well, it could be smart, Spartan in certain respects, but it's not a, it's not a poorer, worse place to be, that it has its own richness, it has its own fulfilments. And those fulfilments have been impeded by the consumer capitalism that we thought was going to deliver us progress forever. And so, you know, actually offering that possibility, building that possibility, is something that we have to allow ourselves the time to do and not be too pushed by this question of, is it of too panic. late? Um, I, I think it's one of the reasons I said to you earlier that you know there's a queue in my house to read the book after me. They'll take all my post-it notes out, I'm sure. But part of that is because I, I think what I've conveyed <laughs> to my family is the optimism that that it came from it that there is this opportunity to build something new and and young people at the moment are clearly affected by that rabbit in the headlights that feeling of, of overwhelm and anxiety as to oh but you guys had it all and there was opportunities but now we just have to fit in and and hope you guys are going to sort this out for us or, or take to the streets it's, it's sort of and 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 I love that that optimism that actually you can reinvent it. So, mm. you know, let's have the conversations and there's this, it's not quite the, the wild west where you can, it can reinvent yourself, but there is something about that, that we are in a new dawn rather than um, just seeing the, the curtains come down, so to speak. I'm seeing so many questions. Everybody's doing questions earlier than normal. I have lots more questions on my own, but I'll, I'll, I'll hop to these ones just to, to see. Um, uh, teen 
has said, uh, thank you, Tim, for this incredibly beautiful book. Someone who runs a venture philanthropy for women and girls, I often see statistics that frame the argument for gender equality in terms of increase in GDP. Here are a couple. Global cost of violence against women estimated at 1.5 trillion or 2% of GDP. Or if 600 million more women were connected to the internet in the next three years, it would lead to a rise in GDP of between $13 billion and $18 billion. What metrics would you suggest that could convey that importance of achieving gender equality without always having to tie it to the GDP? That's a great question. Well, I mean, yeah, it is a great question. And I mean, it's, it's, almost in, it's almost a kind of hideous insult to argue that the only reason for educating yeah. girls is so that it'll improve our GDP. I mean, for fuck's sakes, that's, you know, it's, there. there's, I, I think, you know, when you educate girls and it's been very well proven, you know, in, in less developed countries, you, um, you know, you reduce fertility rates, you improve quality of life, you lower maternal morbidity, you, you create development at the local level, you embed that development in the community rather than having it sucked out through export markets. You do so much to the social fabric of the community by that simple thing of, of you know, investing in girls. And, and you know, that's, that's proven statistically at all sorts of levels. And I think it's generally true. So, I mean, some of the interesting indicators that you might think about for more gender equality is what's the, you know, what's the humaneness of the conversations that we're having? What, what's the decisions that are being made in boardrooms? What's the um, politics that we're playing out at the national level when you have better gender equality and of course more diversity generally i would argue and and there are lots there are lots of very good attempts to to measure that yeah no um and that makes me sort of jump to something slightly that you know is it that part of capitalism that we've become addicted to the simplicity of indicators <laughs> that we just want one please and then the minute it becomes humanity or something that can't be measured clearly we've decided that that's just not quite um that's not quite good enough or valid enough yeah so. i'm not sure if it's implicitly to do with capitalism but it is very definitely a kind of a trend in modernity and possibly comes from a sort of rationalist streak possibly even from the enlightenment to some extent and i think it's you know it's one that i struggle with a little bit because i do think that some of that matters to, to mm. be able to not just be telling ourselves you know pleasant fireside stories that warm the cockles of our heart and leave the poorest in society destitute out out of our sight yeah. it's deeply wrong so so we, we have to you know we have to have an eye to that danger of of not having indicators but it, it's interesting i mean i start the book with the story of robert kennedy and as many people might know he was a you know, one of the earliest and most prominent critiques, uh, critics of the of the GDP as an indicator. And when you read, you know, when you go back to that speech that he gave at the University of Kansas in 1968, it is partly about that measurement issue. And the measurement issue is quite often the one that it's remembered for, so that even David Cameron, for example, in the coalition government, was quoting Robert Kennedy when he set up the well-being indicator set uh that that the ons now provides and 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 you know you could read it that way that you just if we just get the indicators right it'll be okay but if you look at the depth of of kennedy's speech there you know it's actually saying something more profound he's saying something profound about the values that we hold and the way that they're executed in society and what we put forth first and foremost in our economies and what in the process gets subjugated and 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 what government can do about it and should be doing about it and and you know his his part of of inspiring me was to some extent uh that measurement issue but it was it was the realization actually that it was a kind of you know a political conscience that made sense outside of that narrow uh, measurement issue and that was as profound probably more complicated but equally vital to address and and you know i think i think it's it's not you know either or on that indicators issue it's we do obviously need the right indicators but we shouldn't you know be trying to put a value a quantitative value on everything there are some aspects of the human experience and of what it means as a society to progress which will be difficult to measure but are on the other hand not impossible to evidence 
Yeah, no, and I think you do it brilliantly in the book, by the way. Um, we, we won't give all the book away because <laughs> those of you who haven't read it will have to mm. go and, and buy it. Um, but I, yeah, I, I know that for one, I was kind of uh, the myth of growth. For me, there was also, I, I projected onto it, or maybe, I don't know if it was a projection, this myth of the rational and selfish man that has, you know, it's been repeated over and over again, which seems to be a cornerstone in, well, that's just how it is. And that's part of why this capitalist system works uh, as is. Um, was I just projecting or? No, no, that's absolutely, that's absolutely there. <laughs> and, and it's also something that I critique and I critiqued in Prosperity Without Growth as well. And, and to me, you know, this kind of rational, selfish, hedonist, um, yes, mostly male in the, in the kind of image of it, is something that lives inside economics. It's supposed to make the economic models work. It's a complete travesty when it comes to the diversity of human beings. But it's also not something that's really recognizable in literature, in the wisdom traditions, in ordinary people's lives, mm -hmm. in communities. It's not really something that's recognizable in sociology or psychology. And, and actually, the, you know, I, I point very specifically to the psychology of Shalom Schwartz, for example, yeah. who, who, who offsets that idea of selfishness and, and poses its alternative altruism as something that is as deeply rooted in the way that we evolved as species, as selfishness is. And he points to, you know, conservation and traditional values as being as deeply rooted in our success as a social species as novelty seeking hedonism is. Yeah. And, and, then, and then you look at that, the kind of map of the human heart, if you like, and you see that what economics has done is it's pushed us into the selfish hedonistic novelty seeking segment and forgotten about three quarters of the human psyche. And that's, again, is a very, it's a very empowering place to be because it sort of says, you know, that the future is not about the narrow constraint of the human heart. It's about an opening out of the possibilities for what it means to be human. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think that goes through the book beautifully. You know, um, there's, I think there's places you talk about that, you know, that profound human quality of striving. And then you link it even into the Buddhist tradition of, you know, the craving um, which leads to suffering and there, there's and, and for me one of the things I, re I really enjoyed about the book was the the straddling of the systems and 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 humans who all of us are at the the core of the core of that and and sometimes that's missing um in you know we're trying to have systems based solutions many of the people on this call work for systems change um but you kind of get stuck if you don't also as far as I see it, I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on the uh, the individual human and humanity um, for how, how we develop. Um, I think it's really important. It's really important, particularly for people who work in social change, I think, and I've always felt this. It came very strongly from a, a colleague of mine, Nick Marks, uh, who developed the well-being program at the New Economics Foundation back in the 1990s and he and I very early out we, we worked very early on actually on an alternative measure to the GDP the what's now called the genuine progress indicators and we were just working on that stat stuff but he came from a, a background in which he was training as a psychotherapist um, and had a, you know and, he, and and together we as we began to talk about these issues and think about them you know we did we sort of began to realize that this the change that, every, that we're all working for to some extent, you know, we, we're not going to achieve without the sense of an internal change. And, uh, and, and that that's as an important a task, perhaps even more important task for people working in social change as, as anywhere else. Um, and, and that, that, you know, that internal task is, I mean, what's empowering about it is it's, it's always available. You know, everybody can make the decision to work, at their internal level on their own processes of change. Everybody holds their own journey. And, and this is where it touches this Buddhist philosophy to some extent, in particular Thich Nhat Hanh's idea, you know, that, that um, the, the, the way, as he describes it, and the power of the way is, is in fact to guide us at every step as individuals in whatever the outside circumstances may be and to always give us that potential for, for internal change. And of course, it's a hard thing to do and not everyone does it. Not everybody wants to do it with that same depth. And I'm not decrying all the excellent kind of activist anger that's turned outwards from that 
towards change in society. I think that's a really important thing to do. We don't rest on the laurels of our own personal enlightenment if we're lucky to find it. But on the other hand, that sense of a personal journey can, and I think, you know, it's a really important component in balancing um, change and change making in the outside world. Um, I want to come back to balance, but I'm just going to hop us to Terry has sent an, um, a, a, put a question in. So he says, um, regarding the comment on securing more freedom in academia, I'm interested if you have any advice to those inside the public sector system. I run the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency and our overriding strategy is called One Planet Prosperity. We must stick within our legal remit, but we can push the boundaries and we do push the boundaries as much as possible. We know, I know. Um, what do you advise people like us, or what do you want from people like us to help create a better future? Thanks, Terry. Yeah, I mean, keep doing that work for for, for sure. Um, the thing I would say, I suppose, and I and this comes from the sort of experience, a little bit of working with the SDC. Um, there was there's a period there was a period and I I see I think of it now almost like a golden age um you know before we had before Tony Blair had kind of ruined his political capital by getting into bed with warmongers in the US over impossible wars across the world um and, and there was a sense of an opening out of government a space where different things could happen different things different processes of change could be started and it was like for people who had you know, worked with government in the pre that pre uh, before that Labour government that Tony mm. Blair brought in in 1997, it was like a breath of fresh air. And it brought people into that context who had not been there before. It brought vision into that context. It brought a variety and a diversity of views into that context. And it created some wonderful outputs, actually, one of which was the Climate Change Act of 2008. Another was the Sustainable Development Strategy of around about 2005. And, and if you look at those documents now and look at what they achieved now, they are incredibly progressive, particularly for their time. And this sense of an openness of space, I think, I think you know it came from individuals seeing the opportunity within government within policy spaces to create those conversations and to build change from them and I think that's still it's harder now I think there was a kind of closing down after the I would say after the financial crisis and and things got you know very it it was almost like I, I don't know if you know the film Awakenings Yes. You know, which describes Oliver Sacks's experiments with with people who managed to wake up from a coma with, mm. a, with a magical drug, and then they they gradually through the end of the film they start going back to sleep again, and he can't keep them awake. That's what it feels like a little bit to me in government. You know, we had this period in which there was an openness that was absolutely wonderful, and and it created changes which are still in progress and still part of our legislative structure. And then we kind of somehow gave up on the idea of that space, or it became institutionalized i'm not sure that i know the answer exactly but i do know that i've seen it most actively that space in the devolved um governments um and i've seen it in scotland i've seen it in wales i've seen it in some of the welsh legislation particularly the future generations act and yeah. and it, what it does what it what it needs is the energy of people who are working in that environment to keep that space open to keep diversity coming through it to not be afraid of challenging um and to not become a, too attached to their public sector pensions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Terry's waving and saying, thank you. I can see. Um, wonderful. Gosh, I, I can see I've got to do more questions. Otherwise, lots of people will be disappointed. So I'm just going to um, I'm going to do them a little bit more randomly than I would like to, I think, because there's just they're rolling in. Carrie put one in a little bit earlier. Carrie Norton said, isn't it enlightened collective interest to center well-being of those least privileged in our societies. Is that right, Carrie? Is that what you're, yeah? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. And I think that's, um, you know, that's an ethic that runs through, um, yeah, faith traditions, wisdom traditions, our own sense of ourselves um, and our experience of our families and our communities. A sort of sense of that you know and, and uh, is, prosperity for me means very little if if those around me are suffering and um 
And sometimes, you know, sometimes it means more. So is there something, um, is there a link here around kind of, we've talked about values, the book talks about values and purpose, I guess. And, you know, so I, in everyday job, deal mainly with businesses and and looking at how do they take purposes and, and how do they transform for a greater good purpose. I just wonder, you know, when you spoke about the sort of government um, having had this open period then closing down, is there something about clarity of, of communal values that has gone missing since that time where I there, guess- was, there was a period and I think that became very very clear but I mean I think we can't see that we shouldn't see that in too naive a way it wasn't just something that disappeared because bad people got into government it was also no, no, part no. of a political process and the social process and the social dynamic and I would argue I would even root that social dynamic in some of the problems around our growth-based economy and the argument goes something like this I sort of rehearse it in the myth of myth of growth chapter or is it the next one? I can't remember. Um, and, it, and it sort of goes, you know, go, as, as uh, our, our growth-based economy began to run into problems, particularly with the underlying labour productivity growth, we tried to stimulate that. And government tried to get it back again by stimulating it. And largely they did it by pumping money into the system and protecting the interests of capital um, because it was understood or believed that that kind of capital investment would make it might make the rich richer but that would trickle down to the poorest and everything would be well we'd get growth back and of course it was a really bad strategy in a sense because you suddenly had this support of capital capital and capitalism um, with plenty of money to play with and big returns for those who could make profits from it and at the same time as the underlying labor productivity in the economy was declining and that meant that margins for producers were squeezed um, and that meant that workers wages were depressed and that meant that investments real investments in the future were more difficult to attain and so what you had you had this kind of fantasy market going along the top which a lot of people were getting a lot of rich richer out of but it was creating actually an economy that was poorer at its heart and in which certain sectors of the population were actually beginning increasingly to be disenfranchised and to me that process was exactly the one that led to the financial crisis yep. the government's response to it then led to a period of austerity that worsened the social outcomes and then you've got a set of people who are um, deprived who are alienated who have no faith in the economic system or even the politicians who run it. And they, as Hannah Arendt pointed out, are deeply susceptible to malevolent, powerful influences who can turn that tide into something to their own political ends. And I think we saw that in, in Brexit to some extent, and definitely, I think I would say. And we also saw it in Trump's America. And, yeah. and in the process, the core values that could have offset that, the civilizing, social values began to be eroded and that's a really dangerous situation I mean what I would say what I would say now and I kind of say on the back of I suppose of you know Trump not being elected for a second term and a shift a sort of relief actually mm -hmm. that that set of values that we had been told were useless uh, is is now possible to put back on the table and those values that we were being asked to espouse, you know, the values of masculine power in particular and its dominance over um, both nature and the rest of society um, have been brought low or at least brought lower. And they've been exposed actually to some extent and they've been rejected uh, in that electoral process. And, and that to me, that gave me an enormous sense of relief, particularly actually as a, as a man, because I felt absolutely horrified by the kind of ethics and the values of the most powerful leader in the world. And, and, the, and, and I think, you know, it had its knock on effect. It had its knock on effect through values that we saw here through the Brexit process, our approach to foreigners, our dominance, you know, dominance against violence, against women um, in ways that, that, that are social and quite subtle, but are really uh, disastrous. It seems to me for, for the prospect any meaningful prospect of prosperity yeah. and, and so recovering recovering those values is like it's like a task that you know we we all have to engage in and when we see those values eroded by our leaders you know that's the place where real political danger lies i think 
No, uh, that yeah, that all makes very sense. And as a Dane in in the UK, I yeah, Brexit <laughs> was very close to my heart um, for quite a long time and distressed. But um, the so two questions to that is um, in the book you talk a lot about balance um, as kind of the you know as key to 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 a lot of things, and I'd love to to hear more of what you say of balance. But one of the things that struck me as you sp spoke just then was. Um, that relief uh, that many of us felt when Trump didn't get uh, get re-elected, that there was hope that maybe the good guys were, you know, maybe Obama in the White House wasn't just a blip type um, type thing. And, and yet, um, do we need to dismantle some of the kind of dominant mechanisms in the world very, very quickly, like social media, which is because it's driven by a need to make, uh, you know, to drive advertising dollars is... Is, is built to exacerbate extremes, to push these things. Do we need to do something quite quickly on, on those types of things so we don't end up in the same place again? Are there I think, some Well, I think, you know, actually possibly worse places. So definitely there's, there's, there's scope for that. Um, I want to say something about balance, but I just, I just saw it flashed up, um, Rajan's comment, the future is a BBC4 <laughs> Scandi Noir TV drama. Thank goodness <laughs> Borgen is coming back. <laughs> that is the best news I've heard all day that Borgen is coming back. Is it really? Is that true? I mean, I kind of, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a nice kind of reflection and it's, it's, uh, I just wanted to talk about it, but the balance yeah. question, I think your balance question is really, uh, you know, I, because to me that, that it is important. And, it, and it's when you look at wisdom traditions, you see this principle of balance coming through. And in some ways, I mean, I came to it actually, interestingly from the pandemic itself, because, you know, when you think about prosperity as being about health rather than wealth, the interesting thing about wealth is it's something that accumulates. You just go on getting more and more of it. You accumulate and you accumulate. The interesting thing about health is it's all about balance. It's not about having more and more. Sometimes it's about having less and it's about mm. finding. And it goes back to that Aristotelian ethics that you love, that sense of a, of a, of a virtuous balance between too much and too little, uh, between between selfishness and altruism, between novelty seeking and tradition, um, and 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 indeed between you know absolute freedoms and the protection of our children from the freedoms, the damage that those freedoms can create. So having some way, you know, having some way to regulate the the people who are essentially becoming, you know, the most powerful people in the world through access to technology and the returns to that technology and the absence of taxes on that technology oh, you know that that is scary and people like carol cadwallader who are fighting that fight you know they do it at their peril most of the time but it's absolutely essential i think no um absolutely um i want to do you you talked about devolved governments and, and you know, I revealed that I come from a very small country originally. The, um, do you think there's something about size here to, and community? That Well, this is, I mean, this is a really interesting, I think this is a really interesting argument. It's an argument that's been made, you know, actually since Jean-Jacques Rousseau, I suppose, you know, yeah. that uh, it's civilization that screwed us up. And before that, we were actually happy savages. And then, you know, there are, there are some modern day versions of that, like Rutger Breckman's, uh, humankind um, which is a book I think you wanted a book recommendation I definitely yeah. recommend that it's a fascinating book if you haven't looked at it and and you know these arguments essentially that the structures of civilization solidified power in ways that were destructive to the well-being of all um, and that this was this was reinforced by by questions of scale and 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 the ability of scale to to really concentrate power in, in very narrow places. And, and so I do think it's an important argument. And I do think that kind of, when you look at countries which have had a more social economics, and they do tend to be the Scandinavian countries, a little bit perhaps Germany, um, some countries in Latin America, you find that the, the sort of community ethic, the sense, the sense of scale and the playing out of scale at community level tends to be a stronger element in the in the political mm -hmm. script than it does in the very hierarchical anglo-centric neoliberal economics that came out of yeah. the uk and the states basically so i do i do think that's important i i remember when i was doing a lot of work on consumer behavior and um there was a uh, a 
a behavioral psychologist who, who was talking a lot about energy and, and he, he talked about this, you know, community governance aspect as being the, the missing policy out of ideas to change people's uh, behaviors. And he based that actually on the theory of a guy called Kurt Lewin, who had a, a theory called field theory. And it basically argued that when you're trying to make changes, it's really helpful to have a safe place to do that. And that safe place happens at community level, it happens at the small scale level. And GAP, Global Action Plan, actually used that basic, that theory to create the program of change that they propagated um, quite successfully, in, first in terms of energy and then later in terms of behavior, and now in terms of system change. Um, and because, because it's true, because actually when you have a safe environment in which you can talk and get feedback, with a small group of people who you trust and know, that is a place where it's safe to change. Yeah, and that's and, and interesting, you know, that's exactly how we're helping companies drive tra- change within, is give give that space for different ways of working for with sort of safety um, to fail. <laughs> so really interesting. Oh, oh, I can see Sophie's writing the names of the books down. Thank you. Um, Let's let's hop to to more questions because otherwise we will not get there. One quick question on feminism, because in the book, what, what struck me again was a lot of women: Hannah Arendt, Lynn Margulis, um, Wangari Matai, Matai um, hmm. and, and and just checking in of how do you see feminism as part of the solution in all this? Because you, you mentioned quite strongly, you know, the masculine and dominance. I'd love to hear what, how do you, how would you want it to be playing out? I, I would want that question around gender to be playing out. I, you know, I think it's a really important one. Um, I think there are times when versions of feminism have 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 become in contextualized as antagonistic, um, and and perhaps that plays a part. I was quite influenced by work. Uh, that critiqued early feminism called No More Sex War by Neil Linden. And, and, and I think it came from the sort of hurt male perspective that I don't think there's a lot of sympathy for, to be perfectly honest. But what it did do was it highlighted something which I don't think we can ignore in the same way that, you know, Kate Pickett and, and Richard Wilkinson highlighted that inequality hurts everyone in society, not just the, the least well off. I think, you know, gender inequality hurts everyone in society too. I think it hurts men. I think men don't understand that they're hurt at the moment. I'm pretty sure some women would think, it, you know, who gives a fuck if men are hurt or not? They've had the best end of the day for quite a long time. That argument. But, I, but I also think that, you know, there is a job to do with men actually, because I think, you know, freeing ourselves from uh, the, the, the diversity roles that we have been forced into that have given us, um, you know, not just uh, shit outcomes in terms, of, in terms of the kinds of things that we're allowed to do and not allowed to do, but also have divorced us from what we want most in the world, which is a healthy relationship with the opposite sex. Lovely. Um, wonderful. And now I, I'm going to put my my list of questions to one side, or, or thinking that I had. Um, Susan brings up something that I hadn't thought of, but um, Susan Joy says, "I'd love to hear your thoughts on post growth in relation to consumer goods, such as fashion created in developing countries." Yeah, That's clear. We need to produce and consume less, but entire economies, such as Bangladesh are predicated on global fashion industries, continued overproduction of underpriced goods. We saw a huge pain of order cancellations during the COVID crisis. Shifting those economies are clearly challenging. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, we've, we've actually looked quite a lot at this. I've got a student who, who did his PhD around this and, um, and, you know, it becomes, a few things become clear. Yes, there is a dependency or there has been a dependency uh, within those poor countries on supply chains, which produce goods, which are sold very, very cheap here in, in the UK, for example. 
um, as part of our consumption trend. And this argument that, you know, the best thing to do is therefore to keep that consumption going faster because then they can produce faster and then they become richer and then everything will be okay, just has not played out. You know, it hasn't played, it didn't play out in Rana Plaza. It hasn't played out generally since then. Um, it's been disastrous in some sense. And, and we also did work looking at, you know, what would something as simple and as basic as paying people a living wage do within that supply chain? And most of the benefits of that happen in the in the developing country itself even though actually you are making those people richer and they are spending more and they're therefore to some extent emitting more carbon if you're paying a living wage to those people a you know fundamental principle of decency mm. um, then yes it does make some of your clothing more expensive and that means maybe you do use less of it and that's probably a good thing because you're reducing the overall demand for those clothes but i don't think and, and our modeling kind of supported this that doesn't undermine the legitimacy of having people being paid a decent wage in a poor country to produce goods and quite often and increasingly actually the markets for those goods will be amongst poorer developing and emerging economies and so this argument really that you know you don't you don't want to slow down consumption of of cheap clothes in the uk um, because it'll hurt those economies doesn't stack up. The right response, it seems to me, is that you pay, you, you have decent supply chains with good working conditions and those people are paid living wages to work in a safe environment that is properly invested in. And, and to do that, you must challenge the economic model of the fashion industry that has created unsustainable consumption at the cost of the quality of those people's lives. Thank you. Susan, I hope that answered your question. Otherwise, feel free to pop a follow-up. It's quite up. interesting that I, I have could... been, I, the, one of the surprising places for the, de the debate about post-growth actually has been sustainable fashion. And it is, it is a very lively debate at the moment. Yeah, so th there seems to be lots going on, in, yeah, as you say, in that area. And yet nobody is, um, yeah, it doesn't feel like we're, I, I haven't seen us get closer. I remember, I guess it must be 10 years ago, almost having a conversation with um, somebody from a very big global um, fast fashion brand who said, you know, actually right now he's head of sustainability, I think. And he said, uh, right now we're doing everything we can unless we change our business model. And that's kind of beyond my pay grade because um, they were taking back clothes. They were giving living weight, you know, he felt like they were ticking all these boxes and yet. The business model was business still expensive. Model, yeah, just mm. not okay what yeah. Susan's saying she's popped in again um the problem of course for those developer nations is that if you move to a living wage then production moves to another nation so it needs a global response um yes to some extent but i think i i, I mean i i don't know if susan maybe you want to sort of come more live into the conversation but i guess my challenge to that would be that actually you know there still would seem to be something called corporate responsibility that should apply to individual companies and of course you know that question of the above my pay grade is a very very difficult one when you're inside that corporate environment mm -hmm. but it is a place where you know it matters to your shareholders and matters to your stakeholders and and it matters to your ability to continue to have a social license to operate that some of those things are put in place and and i think that you know that was one of the learnings from Rana Plaza in particular was, um, you know, industry kind of scrambling to say, what do I do in these circumstances? Because this is clearly uh, a result of, of behaviours that are implicated in my supply chains. Um, and, and therefore, you know, I, I can't get away with that business model anymore. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right. And, and it feels like the, the, because there's this movement from investors, from governments, from consumers who are checking up that that the corporate responsibility hopefully um, could weigh in there. So you don't just move it from Bangladesh if Bangladesh decides that you know living wage should be paid. Yeah. Um, oh. Um, and I, see I mean, they, something there is yeah. something to be said for one of the things that happened after Rana Plaza, which is that those supply chains with different companies began to get together and understand that they had to some extent to work in concert um, in order to be able to do basic things like pay the living wage that they wanted to do. And I think that's, you know, that's a positive thing. But, you know, it also could be questioned whether more should be done and more, more pressure should be placed 
on those companies, um, for example, by government, uh, to make that mandatory rather than voluntary. But you did see some of that voluntary response going on. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, and we just we just need more of that. And I feel like there has been more of that since Rana Plaza um, across the board, hopefully. I see, um, and David's made a little comment. I don't think it's a question, you can read it. Um, um, but that drives us into, I just want to touch on another facet of the book, <laughs> which is this idea of competition and collaboration. Um, because you, you talk about it brilliantly and, and I loved, and I hadn't seen actually Lynn Margulis's um, kind of definition that evolution has come from collaboration rather than competition, which I, I love and I've written it down. I'm gonna keep that very, very close to my heart. How do you see, maybe just, how do you see us moving from this, both the mindset of competition, but the need for competition and, and collaboration? You know, even I was in a call earlier today about a collaboration and it was really clear that, that several of the parties were not, were not quite committing to full collaboration because of the financial needs of, of each of the organizations. So there was this sense of competition just running through the meeting. How do we move from one to the other, do you think? I mean, I think it, the, the difficult thing about that is that it really depends on structures. And nobody knows this more than an academic. You know, an ac academia is a, is a horribly competitive place where territory is everything. And, and yet, you know, there's this kind of sense that particularly from the research funders and everyone else that we should be collaborating with each other. And, and, and actually collaboration makes more sense uh, within that environment because it does enhance knowledge. It enhances your capacity to, to, to change and to find new knowledge. Um, but, the, but, but a lot of the incentive structures are just pointing in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, you know, that's a part of, it's a part of this sense that I had and the sense that I was trying to point to in the book that below what we take as read as the rules of the game lies a set of assumptions and a set of ideologies that belong to thought that is actually at the moment yeah. bankrupt. Um, and, and you can trace that as I did for this concept of competition in economics and, and as opposed to collaboration and the way in which it borrowed its legitimacy from evolution, which was all thought to be about competition until Lynn Margulis, you know, and yes, she was a woman and yes, she was a biologist and yes, she was thinking differently. And yes, she was pointing in a completely different direction to the way that even her husband, who was Carl Sagan, was pointing, you know, looking at the stars for progress. Lynn Margulis had her, her sights on the bacteria that inhabit the primordial slime that still lives in the bottom of our mud and looking at the way that bacteria is developed and saying, actually, you know, what happened here was radically different. It was about a phenomenal form of co collaboration that gave a step change to evolution. It was not Darwinian competition playing out the survival of the fittest through the struggle for existence um, in, that, in that way in which even economics had now begun to say was the right way to live. It was a completely different mechanism. So what, what we've, you know, to, to, to kind of, bring that story back together, what we see as the rules of the game belong to ideas that were inhabited in, in theories that to some extent were also driven by social situations like the emergence of capitalism in the 18th and 19th century that colored even our theories of nature itself. And it took someone from outside that and someone of a different gender to kind of stand up and say, no, you've got, you've got this not totally wrong. Of course, there is competition, but it isn't all there is. And so, you know, the minute you start writing all your rule books as though competition is all there is, that's the point at which you hardwire your institutions and make it impossible for us to act in ways which are uh, collaborative rather than competitive and so opening that out you now how do you go about opening that out and I think I mean I think you have to attack it at every level you have to attack it at the scientific level you have to attack it at the level of the philosophy of science and the understanding of science you have to attack it within the institutions where you see it 
is another book for you, actually. It's Michelle Meager, who's written a wonderful book called Competition is Killing Us. And, and it's basically attacking those myths of why competition is the way in which things could be run. And there's a danger. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm open to the idea that there's a danger that you throw out the baby with the bathwater and that there is actually a value in some forms of competition in some forms of spaces. And, and I think it's quite important to hold on to that that idea again it's an idea of balance the competition and collaboration are kind of quite finely balanced but you then also have to proactively begin to instill the values of collaboration in at every different institutional level and in particular in the rules of the game that you're asking people to play and at the personal level you know i think that's something that that i in leaders that i admire is something that i see you know, that deliberate fostering of values of collaboration, cooperation. Yeah. Where, where I've seen it, I guess, in, in sort of everyday life is, is in my philosophy has been, well, if we, if we, we as an organisation or me as a person can be really centred on what we do best and what, what we love doing and comes to your point of flow, which might, might get to my nod, um, then... You must get to that, surely. Um, to then we that. can be... <laughs> then we can be open and and I've kind of you know my team are probably sick of hearing me say well let's have a an abundance mindset that there's enough for everyone in terms of funding or whatever it is but and so as long as we stick closely to what we're good at and invite people in to contribute with what they're good at it will all work and actually in the last I guess four years three and a half years that has been really successful and we've got some good partnerships out of it but there's something about the mindset of of feeling that you're enough and and you know kind of what what you're good at and if others are better then either you shift or you get you get better too so there is the competition part of it Mm. but there's something about yeah I think the inner alignment of an organization of of what they're good at and and I can see people talking about incentive design in the chat but that's it right is 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 being incentivized both to collaborate but also just to to really find your flow now flow the only other sign um sort of academic i have heard speak about flow is my great friend who's a professor of sports psychology at u of a in canada um so i was kind of taken aback when i saw it come up in the book and and, and in depth tell me about this and tell me about your study of flow because I'm fascinated and I would love to see more of mm. detail of that yeah I mean actually interestingly I first came across it in sports psychology is a lovely book called uh the inner game of tennis and uh I used to play a lot of tennis um back in the day and and what it points out is how much of tennis actually happens in the mind mm. And the, that mind, you know, the way in which that plays out is, is about achieving a kind of state of mind that is very, very concentrated in which you're, you're so absorbed in task that you're kind of one with the task and your awareness of time changes, your awareness of other, other bits of your surrounding change and, and, and even your sense of identity to some extent changes. And, and, and it's it sort of, you know, when I began to look at that and began to look around at the knowledge around that, I, I, I began to found a sort of embryonic theory of this, particularly from the work that um, Mihaly, Chishem Mihaly has carried out on flow. Mm-hmm. He had a 1990 book, which I think is just called Flow or something like that. And, and th- th- there was a kind of theory of what's going on in the brain, but also what's going on in the social context when you can achieve these these feelings and and this sense of immersion in task and this sense of being in the moment and this sense of kind of time passing without you being aware of it and 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 then psychology that matches that sense of flow to high states of well-being so you know it's it's proven to lead to higher well-being not just at the moment that you're engaged but actually in the long run over time and then look at, you know, that, so that's the impact of being in this state of flow. It's a good life. Mm. And, and then the other point, which was really interesting that we began to discover was that materialism and materialistic values undermine your ability to achieve this state of flow. And Chishen Mihaly kind of, he put forward this very interesting hypothesis, which was that basically, um, you know, flow-based activities are, are materially lighter than other 
activities because you're giving your attention to a task and because actually what's giving you well-being from that activity is your engagement with it as a human being and and we wanted to know we wanted to know all sorts of things you know where does it happen where can it happen um this antecedent this this materialism and, and its ability to undermine flow where does that come from and what are the implications of this for you know a vision of prosperity which actually could be which could be richer which could be deeper which could be more fulfilling in exactly the way that i was talking about that i wanted post growth to be able to say that there's a vision of humanity a vision of ourselves here that is richer and better than the one that we've been sold in consumer capitalism and it speaks directly to that it even tells you to some extent that cap that capitalism and consumer capitalism and materialistic values are preventing us from reaching this state now you know it's still quite it's it's in its infancy the science of this although there's some fascinating mm. neurophysiology which kind of locates Wow. interestingly a balance between dopamine and cortisol as being the place where you can find yeah. this flow like so you know yeah. it is again it goes back to that balance but but also you know this kind of really interesting idea that um that we we give away our prospects for flow in consumer society because we've been materialistic but also because that materialism leads us towards you know aspirations for comfort comfort leads us away from the effort that we need to develop the skill through which we can meet challenge and skill challenge again a balance the balance between skill and challenge is what leads to the state of flow and so and and there's a kind of you know there's a, a sort of a corollary of that which is even more interesting which is that one of the things you need to exercise your skill is self regulatory resources and one of the things that undermines self regulatory resources is the avoidance of things that are undesirable you know our kind of lure, the lure of comfort and ease and the turning away from things we don't like and don't look happy and fluffy um is preventing us finding this post capitalism this idea of of a humanism that goes beyond the materialism of consumer society and so that's you know it's a, it's a bit it, much to get into a very short well, period but that's you know, the, you know yeah. that's the thrust of it and and to me it's fascinating partly because i think it's very democratizable yes you know there are some elements of flow you know which you have to be uh rich gregarious privileged and um deeply unethical to enjoy but actually we could teach our kids these skills we could present them with these challenges we could have a, a sort of sense of a lifelong learning of how to how to to live within that space of flow and and therefore to be more fulfilled by it and to do it in ways which are less materialistic yeah no it and um, yeah no I, I i agree with you and and the this, this sort of saddening thing is when you look at parenting today, the trend is the exact opposite. The, well, the, the trend is, yes, let's teach them mindfulness, but at the same time, let's remove any sense of unease. Um, in, in Denmark, they call it curling parents. So, you know, you're in front brushing away any snowflake that might <laughs> knock the children out of um, yeah out of course um so it's really interesting and I, I hope you continue with it and i hope that spreads a little bit that links to a couple of questions and i saw i saw john had put one in that is going to be beautifully focused because a little bit about you know how you're trying to do this differently at cusp i guess i i you know multidisciplinary i I, and I know that there are a couple of other institutions that I was thrilled to see the opening of the London Interdisciplinary School as the first undergrad um, degree that they're trying to make interdisciplinary. But I think John said something to the effect of, I'm trying to find it, is CUSP seen as a mutation within the university or is it seen as driving the evolution? How, how is it feeling for you to be in CUSP right now? Um, I've I've always my sort of I sort of the the work that I've done um, and the predecessors of CUSP as well a research centre called Resolve and another one called Sustainable Lifestyles Research Group and I've always thought of them as me trying to instigate some of these values inside an academic institution it's been you know at some point I'll have to write something about it because it's been quite a journey from the mm. beginnings of that. 
and quite hard to get right, partly because of this sort of academic silo, this kind of structure. You know, it goes, the, the, the difficulties of getting people to work in that way go from the, the sublime to the ridiculous. And, you know, the ridiculous is that you can't make a purchase without going through a departmental system that is structured <laughs> in such a way that you have to trade it across an internal barrier, invisible barrier, in order to benefit someone in a different department. And so, you know, that level of mundanity of, yeah. of creating interdisciplinary work embedded right down in the structures. And then the sublime is that, you know, people think of, People are inculcated to think of their ideas as their territory, which they defend, um, and they defend their methodological rights and their claim to knowledge. Uh, I, I've presided over meetings, interdisciplinary meetings, with particularly with economists and sociologists, interestingly, which which I was just like I describe afterwards as blood on the carpet, because it is so fierce and so sort of competitively thought fought and and comes from all those structures around and all those fears and anxieties about identity in a system in which you're prized for the territory that you can create through your discipline and through your knowledge, and and you know it it lives in us all as academics at a very personal level, and so it's been an experiment I would say John really it's been an experiment. To try to create something different and i feel proud of what we have been able to give to a, particularly to a younger generation of researchers who are now out in the world doing all sorts of sorts of wonderful things in different places and i hope that what a little bit of what they took was not just the scientific knowledge it was partly also that sense of a different set of values in in how they work and I think it's too early to say, to, to, to answer John's question completely, whether that's, you know, ultimately going to be a successful experiment or not. But I, it's, it's, it's on the edge, <laughs> I would <laughs> and say. And challenging, I know. It is very, it's very challenging. But, but I, you know, I, I feel fully committed to it. And I, and, I, and I wouldn't have done it otherwise at all. Um, but it's it's like those, you know, it's like that sort of, you know, those experiments that I was talking about in the period in which government was suddenly enlightened, the, the ability of the forces to close down the space within which it's possible to do that is something that we continually, you know, I think we continually have to fight for that. Do not go gently into that <laughs> good night. Wonderful. Um, on education, I can see Marissa has a question as well. She's saying, um, how do we ask educational institutions to move away from psychometric growth models and to open minds for new solutions to address our ecological dilemma? Um, yeah, I think that, I mean, I think that's, it's, it's interestingly, that's one of the kind of um, methodological battles, almost epistemological battles that we have fought at times in, cust you know, what, what, what creates what constitutes knowledge if you if is it measurement and quantitative stuff in the in the conventional econometric or psychometric sense um, or is it a deeper understanding and and i suppose my approach to that has been very eclectic that we need both those kinds of knowledge and that both have some use in society um, but it but it is true that quite often you know for reasons that we were talking about before the psychometric or econometric uh, measurement type sciences have tended to trump qualitative science and it always does it at a disadvantage to knowledge as a whole so i you know i think the way ultimately the way to balance that is to bring these more qualitative insights into play and to do it in ways that you know can appeal to people uh, beyond the sort of narrow confines of of psychometry or econometrics um and you know, it's interesting sociologists think of themselves actually within the research councils as being the poor cousins of social science. <laughs> um, but, but, but actually, you know, the value in terms of, of understanding things and understanding things at depth is huge. Um, so I, so it's, it is a bit of a battle, but it's one worth fighting. Thank you. I'm suddenly seeing time has flown and um, I'm going to take a double question on the two people have asked sort of, um, I think, adjacent questions and they'll we'll wrap up. Um, Ryan Boydell has asked, do we need to abandon our habit of putting everything in boxes, whether economics or political or science, and accept that a more flexible approach is required as we respond to a changing dynamic? And more, so it's more of a matrix than a bar chart. And then Paul Haney 
has in a similar vein, I think, said if the fact that the GDP is a single measure that's part of the problem, will the same or does the same issue affect New Zealand's adoption of a happiness indicator? I thought if we can wrap up on well on that. Yeah, I I think uh I mean, I think they are, you're right, to some extent they are questioned because the living standards framework is a matrix. So um, uh, that, that sort of idea of going beyond a, a single indicator is, is a very good one. So, I mean, I would, I would say yes, basically. I think that is absolutely vital. Um, and, and I, but I would, I guess, also go beyond it because it sort of goes back to that question we were talking about at the beginning about measurement. And I... <sighs> You know, that outcome of one of the outcomes of Robert Kennedy's speech in Kansas was this uh, attention to measurement and how we should measure. One of the outcomes of that was a process that led to the living standards framework and the well-being budget in, in New Zealand. And, and that is a, you know, that's a, that's a very definitive kind of linear path of travel from recognising the limitations of this one index, which has got all sorts of problems in its own right, getting to a framework where you could measure progress in a in a better way in a deeper way and in a more egalitarian way ultimately but i would also return to that other part of that of that kansas speech which was the sort of appeal actually to the values of dignity moral purpose and the poetry of the human soul which you know kennedy was an extraordinary character I, and one of the things i'd say maybe to finish and maybe it's a kind of homework exercise in a way it's an exercise for me. What I would really like to do, having written the book, is to go and kind of put together the documentary evidence, particularly the documentary evidence around the lives and the work of those people into some visual form. Because I spent, I spent hours during the pandemic, days, weeks during the pandemic, not putting pen to paper and excusing myself for not putting pen to paper by indulging in the resources that that gave us visual and poetic insights into the 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 life and the work of those extraordinary individuals that i've described in the book and it's it's a resource if you want to go that way um every one of those resources is in the notes somewhere and somewhere there's a project which would put those together in a way that captured the poetry rather than the measurement of the challenge that we're facing. And I think it's always important to hold on to that idea. Well, that's lovely. That's lovely homework to end on. Um, because I do think you talk in the book about narratives, about myths, and then this, for me, this whole piece around where poetry, arts and creativity, we, we you know, how we can use that really to, to um to bring about that i think it was carrie who also put down you know what's the best way of your great ideas um sort of getting it mainstreamed is that through and and, and actually we at volans have, have a project in the works around the creative industries in the very broadest sense of 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 can we engage those in in bringing some of these ideas to life in a better way than than business folk or even academics can do. Maybe playwrights, this is where you have to revive your career. I may, I may, I may well do that, but I should also talk about our A theme, our arts theme in CUSP. So we actually have a collaboration with Arts Admin, which is a creative organization supporting theater, um, drama and, and arts in the community. And, um, and our next stage of work actually has quite an active program with them on doing exactly that kind of thing so so you know I, I absolutely endorse that idea that's fantastic and we are at time I think there's lots of interesting comments in the chat um I've been looking at Sophie's brilliant little uh, question document instead most of the time but just um just to say thank you and normally I ask what we should what you'd encourage everybody to do if you have anything that you know you've given us a load of books to read I think I saw somebody saying that this these sessions always encourage um more consumerism because he's buying more books <laughs> but um, libraries libraries are good um but yes just um if there's anything else that you want to send us on the road with then then the last word is yours really yeah I'm um... 
I don't know. I mean, we've covered such a lot of ground, and I, I suppose, you know, when I, what I came back to in the book were were some very simple things, and they were about the power and the potential of individual change as much as anything else, which I think is a really important thing at this point in time. And the two kind of tools, which both to some extent came from um, an Eastern tradition and through the wisdom of Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese monk whose life story I talk about. And one of them was this concept that we talked about before of, of, of the way and, and, the, and the being on a path, which is individual to everyone and, and in which our experience of the, our, the power in our lives comes from our experience of that path and, and, and the way. And, and that sense of coming back to the self and focusing on that understanding that as an individual you're in a particular place at a particular time in a given context, learning and bringing your humanity into the world is one that I think is very accessible. It's something, again, that's very democratizable as an understanding. And the second insight that he simply has, which is very biological one in a way, is that we gain a lot and return ourselves to the way by a very simple process, which is called breathing. And, and that idea, again, has enormous power, particularly in situations where we feel like rabbits in the headlights and there's too much to do and we don't know the difference between despair and panic. That simple act of breathing um, is one that's deeply human and deeply powerful in freeing our creativity for the future. Wonderful. So an encouragement for all to breathe before meetings, after meetings, during meetings and um it's hard thanks. to remember it, it, it certainly is um but i hope everybody will i'm seeing lots of thank yous in the in the chat we'll, we'll, i think sophie's going to collate the chat and so if any questions unanswered we might send to you tim and see if um there are brilliant answers to them but definitely all the compliments as well thank you all for joining sorry if we didn't get to every single question but hopefully most of them and um yeah it's lovely to see everyone it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Louise.